Um, everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar on unlocking the potential of black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs in the UK. It's a really critical topic at this point in time. Um, it won't have gone and noticed that there's been a number of seismic event, events that have sort of unfurled in the country. We've had Black Lives Matter, we've had the pandemic, and we're also um, enduring uh, Brexit too. Now, all of those seismic events have had dramatic consequences for the nature of inequality, particularly racial inequality. Um, whatever, however the government responds or uh, and other policymakers respond, you can um, probably bet that encouraging black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs or black and ethnic minority individuals to grow businesses, start businesses, will be amongst the number of policy solutions advocated. For the last 20 years or so, my colleagues and I, my name is Mondo Ram, um, at the Centre for Research in Ethnic Minority Entrepreneurship at Aston University, have been operating at the intersection of these three particular influences, looking at how race, inequality and enterprise interact at an academic level, but as importantly for today's webinar at a practical policy level too. Um, we're very fortunate in that we've got a great list of speakers and discussants who will be able to cast informative light on the challenges and opportunities of supporting black and, and ethnic minority entrepreneurs in the UK. Before I turn over and invite them to um, take part. Let me say a few words to put the issue into context. And I just want to make two or three points. The first point I would make is about the size of the prize. By that, I mean the contribution that black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs make to UK PLC. There have been a number of reports uh, in recent years which have attempted to estimate the contribution of ethnic minority entrepreneurs. Um, the one that my colleagues and I did for the Federation of Small Businesses is perhaps is, um, draws on the most authoritative database, Global Entrepreneurship uh, Monitor information. We produced this report for the Federation of Small Businesses in um, last year, and we estimate that there's at least 25 billion GVA gross value added contributed by black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs to the economy. That is a significant underestimate and we suspect that the actual contribution is much larger. That contribution is on a par with cities like Birmingham and sectors like pharmaceuticals. So significant by any sort of stretch of the imagination. And uh, when we're talking about black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs and about contribution, um, we shouldn't dismiss, uh, we shouldn't ignore the social contribution that black and ethnic minority make, entrepreneurs make. It's considerable. Um, black, these businesses provide employment for individuals who are often excluded from the wider labour market. They often revive neglected uh, areas of the economy and, and cities. They provide an opportunity for refuge uh, for excluded communities. And those kind of qualities have come to the fore during the pandemic. And the government talks about levelling up, building back better. Well, one fairly sure way of achieving that aim or contributing to that aim is to support black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs more effectively. So the size of the prize is important. But in stating the size of the price, we shouldn't ignore, and this is my second point, the enduring challenges facing black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs because they are considerable. For example, um, black Caribbeans, black Africans and other ethnic minority entrepreneurs live in the most deprived area, particularly in parts of London. This was a point made in uh, the report recently by the British Business Bank, which also found that black Caribbeans and black Africans had lower household income. And um, all these factors bear, have a, a deleterious impact on the capacity of 
black and ethnic minority communities to start and uh, run sort of viable businesses. So system, systemic disadvantage endures and often compounding that black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs feel sort of excluded, locked out of um, inst from business support institutions in the finance sector and the general business support uh, sector too. And hence, in our, work, in our work, we found they rely disproportionately on informal networks. So we know that the, despite the contribution, systemic disadvantage endures and is a major constraint on the development of black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs. So what do we do about it? Um, and that really is the topic of today's webinar. And I'm sure our speakers will be able to cast um, much needed light on that topic. I would say that um, the time for action is now, not least because we have a really compelling evidence base. Um, I've talked about the reports undertaken by a variety of different institutions and including and, and uh, researchers, including ourselves. There's more work ongoing um, and people talk about what, what do we have the data? The data can be improved. We, do, we need to do a lot more in terms of data gathering, but there is an absolutely authoritative evidence base already there that uh, justifies action. What we also need is a sort of set of recommendations, template for the way forward. Um, we're at our centre, we're very much uh, of the view that no one party has all the answers. Indeed, the, our, the mission of my centre, CREM, is to make diversity and enterprise everyone's business. That is a recognition of the fact that there are a number of gatekeepers that can influence the trajectory of black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs, uh, not just the government. It's uh, everyone's um, responsibility. So that's really important. And finally, um, I think there's a genuine moment and time opportunity now. Um, many of you will have noticed that um, there is a lot of action in this area. We can have a comment on what the motivation for that interest is, but nonetheless, lots of private sector organisations, um, lots of public sector institutions, growth hubs, combined authorities are now um, making I suppose very warm noises uh, about this agenda. And you know, if you just look at the banks and we've got representatives of the banks here today, a lot of the most interesting initiatives are emanating from the finance sector. So uh, I think we can be really positive about this uh, in sort of saying that there's a huge amount of goodwill. And what we need to do is sort of find a way of harnessing, leveraging that goodwill and, and identify a, a way forward and that's where I think that the contributions, the insights, the perspectives of a really stellar cast of speakers in this webinar will undoubtedly help. So that's enough from me. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Helen, my colleague Helen from Berkeley University to speak. But before that, we have a video from Diana Crouch. Diana Crouch is an, um, the coordinator and advisor to the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Entrepreneurs um, All-Party Parliamentary Group, a bit of a mouthful. Um, that has been set up over the last two or three years and it's done some really as, uh, as interesting work and it's taken a lot, of, made a, 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 done a lot of important work in mobilising interest amongst members of parliament on this agenda. So. I believe now we're going to have Diana's video. Um, it, uh, it's, I believe it's on mute, Asa.
I guess I just unmuted it. I hope we can play it now. Okay. Well, my name is Diana Crouch and I am the special advisor to the All Party Parliamentary Group for Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Business Owners. And the All Party Parliamentary Group is a group of um, MPs from all of the main parties um, that have come together to support um, ethnic minority business owners and to help um, grassroots business owners to get their voices, to have their voices heard at a policy level. Because before the All Party Parliamentary Group was founded a couple of years ago, there was no dedicated group in Parliament focusing on the, need, the needs of ethnic minority business owners. The key objective of the All Party Parliamentary Group is to um, unlock the potential of ethnic minority business owners across the UK. Um, ethnic minority business uh, owners, um, we come from um, every part of the diaspora uh, communities in the UK and have uh, contributed to the UK for decades. And I was working, doing some work in Parliament, and I noticed there wasn't a dedicated uh, group focusing on the needs of ethnic minority business owners. And although there is always a lot of focus on entrepreneurship at government level, um, there needs weren't being attracted. What the All Party Parliamentary Group tries to do is to engage with policymakers on behalf of grassroots business owners um, to draw attention to the issues that um, ethnic minority business owners are facing. And in particular, over the past year, we have, for instance, done a national consultation about the impact of COVID-19 on ethnic minority business owners and looked at whether or not the government's measures have been calibrated enough to, to meet the needs of ethnic uh, minority business owners. And of course, we, you know, it's, um, it, it's in the public domain that we found that um, their needs were not being met. Um, so these, this is the type of work that we do. Um, we're also very keen to make sure that grassroots business owners are able to address come to us to talk to um, the All Party Parliamentary Group and draw attention to the issues um, that they face at a grassroots level. So, and then our, our role in turn is to draw those, bring these to the attention of government of policymakers to make sure that they're considering um, the needs of ethnic minority business owners when um, they're, they're drawing up um, industrial strategy and so on. In the past year, we have looked at um, a range of issues, including access to finance. And in fact, that's been a big issue, which a lot of uh, uh, business owners talk to us about problems with accessing um, everything from uh, business uh, bank accounts right the way through to access to loans and um, investment capital and so on. So at this current time, the All Party Parliamentary Group is working in collaboration with the banking sector to find um, solutions to some of the barriers that um, ethnic minority business owners face when trying to um, access um, finance. Um, we are, we're also looking at access to um, tailored business support services because, again, we're finding that minority business owners complain that um, mainstream uh, business providers don't offer, always offer um, tailored support services and, and, and also that their business networks are not always as inclusive as they could perhaps be. So, you know, that's another area that we're, that we're looking at. One more really important area is um, access to data about what is going on um, at a grassroots level with ethnic uh, minority business owners because we feel very strongly that policymakers are perhaps working blind because they don't have access to um, granular data about the um, everyday experiences and um, the progress of, of businesses that are led by ethnic minority businesses because they're not being monitored. And in fact, during the pandemic, we found that there was no way 
of knowing, for instance, how many ethnic minority business owners have died because there is no national system of collecting data about um, these people. So um, in the middle of a pandemic, um, when we want to be able to see um, what's happening at a grassroots level, we were unable to do that because there is no national system of data collection. So we are working to bring Okay, um, I think that's a uh, very helpful video there. Thank you, Asa. That uh, shows uh, the work that the all party parliamentary group have been doing on th this agenda. Let's now turn to our first speaker, who's uh, uh, Dr. Helen Lawton Smith, Birkbeck University. Um, Helen, can I? to introduce you now, ask you to introduce yourself and, uh, and also talk about the very interesting research that you've been doing on this area. OK, well, well thank you, Monda, for, for chairing and, uh, and thank you, everybody, for being in the, in the panel. So I, I'm Professor of Entrepreneurship at Birkbeck in the University of London. Uh, I'm also the director of the Centre for Innovation Management Research. And what I'm going to be talking today is is about some work that I've been doing and, and two of the speakers I've interviewed as a part of the, the research. So uh, thank you. So if we if we go on and I uh, would also like to thank uh, Asia for, the, for putting this together and also working on, on the project and, and uh, Dina Mansour who's also helped me collect data. So the background to this, this st study is that I was part of the Innovation Caucus team that worked on this project for Innovate UK. It was about supporting diversity and inclusion in innovation. So there was a, a YouGov survey of uh, entrepreneurs um, and innovators with the intention of finding out what the barriers and challenges were to, to, the, to both the, uh, people with disabilities and ethnically diverse uh, populations. And we conducted an, a number of focus groups to see what the real issues were. <clears throat> But as a geographer, I was I was uh, quite disappointed that there was no emphasis on where all this activity was taking place, what, how location mattered, and whether it was being in Plymouth or in, in Newcastle or in in Manchester, South Wales, how that made a difference to the opportunities and challenges that were facing by the entrepreneurs and the networks were that to, to support them. So this is what the, the project was was doing. I got funding from the Regional Studies Association and I've also had subsequent funding from the, the, the BEI school um, for an, an impact grant that's enabled uh, this work to continue. Thank you. So, so, so for the, the next slide, please. So can I can I do it all or? or um, yeah, OK. So. So, sorry, I can't see my slide. OK, so, so this is about the, the geography. So the first task was to map where the organisations are that support uh, the, the two groups of innovators. So surprisingly, there was nothing about this. And so it was quite a challenge to identify where people were. And a lot of it was word of mouth, people recommending other people to talk to, as well as Google searches. And so we were also looking at the, the policy context um, and, and we've already started to get into the policy co context. And so it involved talking to, to people in the different groups, so the um, all party parliamentary groups, but both, both uh, for sure. inclusive entrepreneurship and uh, uh, Diana's group. Um, to also talk to the uh, Cabinet Office Disability Unit and the Race Disparity Unit as well as uh, Innovate UK and the UKRI and also talk to national organisations such as the Leonard Cheshire Foundation and the Stelios Awards just to map the landscape of what was going on in this uh, in this field to see what the policy issues are and how 
the network see what's going on and what recommendations they could make to the policy communities with the idea of what, what could UK national and regional policy do better than it is now. And part of this is, is about disturbing the status quo. And I think Monda's alluded to this, that th there is n now the time that voices can be heard, but it's, it's finding the best ways in which voices can be heard and, and what the best conduits are, what levers can be applied to make, make a difference. And we've already said, well, what are the challenges and what, what do we do about them? So the, ne the next slide, please. I can do it. OK, so this is what what we did. We, we mapped them. Uh, we have the maps, but then they're, they're not very, very helpful because they're all, all a bit confused. So we, we found that there were lots of activity, great practice th throughout the UK. But it's quite patchy and isolated. And so some parts of the country didn't have any uh, initiatives at all. So the West West Midlands, which has five or six networks for ethnically diverse entrepreneurs, doesn't have anything about supporting disability. We also looked at the pattern of London and not surprisingly that there were far more organisations in, in London and we looked at what, what they were doing. The this focus of this talk in the time I have left is from a book chapter that uh, Beldina uh, Awala and I have written for a, a book on women's entrepreneurship. Uh, Beldina and I were part of the Innovate UK team so we we had to look at our data to see what we find out about supporting um, ethnic minority women. So this is the uh, the study that we, that we did and now I'll move on to some of the uh, the data. So as I said best practice throughout the country a lot of activity recently founded and we found three categories of, of networks, membership organisations, charities and commercial activities. And then we can see that they were networking, mentoring and advocacy. So what we hadn't expected, we were, we were using a, an inclusive ecosystems approach and taking some of the, the key uh, elements of the ecosystems approach to see how they relate in looking at these these two groups of people and particularly uh, uh, women's networks in, in this context. So I'll talk a bit more about the advocacy and leadership role because that's really important part of this story. So we're seeing that universities are increasingly interested in minority entrepreneurs and we, we had a meeting of the small business charter today to and they're really interested in what universities can be doing to support SMEs. And that is also part of the broadening the social mission of universities to see what else they can do as opposed to their normal target groups. We did find a lack of dedicated activity for ethnically diverse women entrepreneurs. There, there's some good examples in Scotland and, and, and some in, in London. So we're getting a, a patchy picture. And part of this project um, Mondo's used the word engaged scholarship. And I think this is this uh, event now is part of that is introducing people to each other, maintaining contact with the people that we work with and seeing how we can take those relationships forward. I say so what I, I put on this slide, I know it's it's a bit busy, but what we looked at was those networks that are specific to women entrepreneurs and ethnically diverse women entrepreneurs. So you see the top, the top three, three, um, two in London and one in Scotland. Then the other part of the, the landscape that's worth mentioning is the powerful role of women leaders. So uh, Sharon that uh, Mondas work with quite a lot, Sharon Jandu, she leads the Yabba and she's a very powerful figure and she, she has incorporated the local networks, the Chambers of Commerce and the FSB together to, to drive forward her agenda. So I think it's really important that people like her and Diana Crouch that you've heard of are providing voices on these important issues. But it also important is that they are women and women are seen to be leaders in, in this field. A, a, a third part of the landscape is there's quite a lot on the web now about women leaders and, and, and female entrepreneurs as influencers and speakers. 
So the landscape is changing. We know about the all party parliamentary groups that Innovate UK has got a commitment to diversity and so is so is Bayes. And uh, Mon has already mentioned the work with the British Business Bank. So there's a lot going on, but it, it's still not joined up and it's still not very co coherent. So this idea of developing inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystems is, is what we're about today. It's putting people together, working out what, how we can solve some of, the, some of the problems. And part of that is issues to do with the legitimacy. Some of the um, networks I've spoken to have said it's, it's good working with universities because actually they provide credibility and they, they provide a, a, an, another um, part of our armory. We can say, yes, we're working with, with Birmingham, Aston University, London University, and that helps us give credibility and legitimacy to what we're doing to, to bring about the system change. So I think the universities have an important role to play in this, and maybe we can debate that. But there's also the issue then, is it bottom up? Is it top down? How do we put the two together? How do we overcome the fragmentation? So the loss of the work that Monza does and I've been doing in this project, introducing people to each other, people that didn't know each other and the dedicated website we have for this project is all about the different people and what they're doing and the videos that Aisha's worked with uh, Gabriel uh, recording on these, these things and Kim as well. So. It's getting voices heard and, and bringing people together. And this then with also is that recognition, different kinds of support at neither different stages. And I mentioned finance and it's always about finance. And it's overcoming inbuilt disadvantages so that we know women entrepreneurs always have more problems in raising money than the than male ones, but it's particularly difficult for ethnically diverse women. Sorry, Helen, can I just ask you to sort of wrap up in the next I'm minute sorry. or so? Yeah. yeah, I'll finish now. So so the issues of sustainability of networks and we need to monitor what's going on in order to be able to find out what's working and what's not working. So I'm sorry I've talked for so long. So um, so this is this is a, the, the last slide then. We've already had a call for data. There is a lot of data around, but there's much more to, to be connected. And, and as a geographer, I still like to reinforce this message that policies need to understand the different specificities of place, ethnicity and gender. So so maybe Kim will talk about South Wales when she, she does her talk. OK, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Lots of interesting insights there and lots of interesting points about the importance of sort of leadership. Um, and I suppose you've started um, what I hope will be a trend is to mention the intersection, the importance of intersectionality, role of gender in this uh, space too. So thank you very much. And sincere apologies for A, interrupting, and B, um, unwittingly demoting you at the start. It's Professor Helen uh, Lawton-Smith, not doctor. So uh, now can I move on to our next uh, speaker? Um, I'm just going to call you Professor because I don't want to make another mistake. Jabo, Jabo Batira. Thank you very much, uh, Moda. Thank you, um, Professor Moda. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, very well uh, honored to have that title. Maybe you are giving me a nudge for <laughs> going that direction of getting it. But great to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, Professor Helen. It's uh, amazing to see the work you, you're doing and uh, um, and we are glad, glad we took part into it. So my name is Jabo, Jabo Butera. I'm the uh, co-founder and managing director of Diversity Business Incubator. We are based in the southwest, particularly in Plymouth. Um, I come originally from Rwanda uh, in East Africa. And uh, let me bring a little bit of flavor of diversity, which is the part I am excited about, is that baggage, luggage you have. It's also the language. Let me greet you in my language, which is uh, one of the popular languages in Africa. It's called Swahili. When we greet, we say Jambo, which is mean hello. And that is a wealth on his own. And I'm hoping in the future I'll be able to package it and sell it. That's the entrepreneurial mindset. <laughs> so greetings everyone. Uh, Jumbo to everyone. Um, today uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here to have this conversation and bring my um, contribution to uh, this continued journey and changing landscape of approach when it comes to um, the contribution 
of individuals from the uh, Black and Asian or diaspora communities and all those titles uh, or names or qualification or how it's called, what I see is more of that as a human being, what is my contribution to the society where I'm living? Um, it's uh, sometimes uh, I get it when people come across me or someone different. The first question they, they tend to ask you, so you, what's your name? Which is you introduce yourself. And then later on they say, oh, so if you don't mind, let me ask you, where are you from? Uh, they, they go the British way, they use that, if you don't mind. Uh, but in other words, they say, where are you from? The thing is, they're not asking you particularly geographically where you're from. What they're asking you is, what is your soil? What is the ground you stand on? Where, where, where do you belong to? That's what the question they're normally asking, which soil, which ground do you belong to? And then for an individual like myself of uh, being in a displaced position, so as I say, I come from Rwanda, but I'm based now in, uh, um, in Plymouth. What is my soil? What, what, where do I belong to? That's the question. Where is, am I um, based? What my positioning, my core center where I'm placed? So when you ask my question that where I'm from, I'm, I'm last thinking, oh, where am I from? Two, is asking my children now who were born here, where are they from? It's get too complicated because they have both now. I come in with my African approach and my values. They come in with the British values and they feel they belong to this soil. So all that is what it makes a, a human being, but also the wealth of an individual. And as a diaspora, that's why we look at being, what is it your your values and how you can tweak it and make it an income generator. That's the entrepreneurship mindset. For you just being different, being diverse, it's a wealth. So diversity business incubator, that's what we do. We try to see for each individual saying you are diverse, you are different, you are wealthy. How can you turn that in income generator? So we support entrepreneurship in other terms. We encourage entrepreneurship. We talk about entrepreneurship. We sing about entrepreneurship. We sing about asking people, why are you not working for yourself? Why are you not your own boss? And then it gets even more um, exciting when uh, you tell individuals, say, by just you using your talent or what your mom taught you and you being in a country where they don't have it, actually, it's a big opportunity. Use that, what your mom taught you and express it here where you are because this is your soil, where you are in England now. When you're gonna be feeling, for you to be feeling, this is my soil, I have to be a positive contributor, or I have to be that soil is giving me something I'm proud of. So let me take you a little bit of my journey where I come from, uh, when I moved to the Southwest here in, 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 in Plymouth particularly, in terms of uh, demographic, with, uh, in terms of individuals from black community in, Plymouth, it's very low number compared to Birmingham or London. So I was walking on the streets of uh, Plymouth um, and I met a few black people and I say, hey, how are you? So what do you do? That's my question. What do you do? And they'll go around that question to tell me what they are doing. And the reason was because they were not proud. They were not feeling like, yes, this is what I do. I'm proud of it. So I come from a background of business and I'm like, you need to, my, my children are going to be growing here. They need role models. I need those people going to be walking on the street who look like me. Like, like, yeah. And they're going to say, I know so-and-so, he's this and he's that. I want to be like that, that role model. For us, the best uh, approach we see is that entrepreneurial element where you turn your passion, that wealth you have within you, remove those dust and everything around it and make shiny that gold you have in you that diversity, how do we get shining it? And then how can you turn it to gen income generator? And that will make you feeling proud. You'll be singing about it. You'll be talking about it. And that's the what we do to push for with uh, diversity business incubator. You can find out more about what we do on our platforms. But the question here was our contribution and what are the challenges we're finding most of the time. Uh, my, uh, those who speak before me uh, touched on it most of the time. 
And the big one is access to finance, access to that capital investment. The financial um, system, how it works, uh, is still have that. The one I'm most talked about is the track record. They come and ask you, where are you from? So the machine asks you, where are you from? So when you go to the bank, they put your details in there. The machine trying to find where you're from. Your history is only five years. It cannot open those doors to say you are. They know your history so we can trust you and give you that money to start your business or your idea. Secondly, your idea is not something they see all the time. I'm not coming to sell fish and chips. I'm coming to sell sake and uh, fufu and like put in the system and they say, ding, ding, we don't know you. Yet it's something really interesting. So access to finance is still needed to change. And I'm grateful for um, these uh, researches and this conversation, like uh, what uh, Professor Moda and uh, Professor Holland have been doing to demonstrate it academically. They need that change within the system of access to finances. And what we run to is you go and borrow money from uh, families and you go and start your business because you're passionate to do it. Or sometimes you are against the world. We don't have another choice. This is the only choice you have. Uh, employment, there's a long queue or education. You are, I mean, I've done advanced age, whatever, to go in that route. So you say, I need to be putting food on the table. You go that way of entrepreneurship. But you borrow money from mom and dad or for uncles, or it's a generation difference. There's no mom and dad here. This generation where you borrow from cousins and family member. This, this, the, the other element which is most uh, term, uh, challenging is that the tailor access to the providers of the support, but as well as that opportunity of falling small, it's not given. You don't get a chance to fall small or to try error and make and try again. So you've borrowed money from your cousins. Now you go and start something totally new in a new world and you haven't learned how it's done and all that. And suddenly you, it's not working because I, I don't know who started the business and suddenly they were making money. This does uh, up and down. You don't get the chance to do the down. You only have a, that option to go up. And then you fell and then you're running away from families now. Okay. All those are the challenges. I know how so, one minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got my timer. Yeah. Those are the challenges. So what can we do? Let's continue talking about it. Let us encourage entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is one of the great assets we can utilize to have this what you call integration. When I'm feeling I am a positive contributor by just being me, by being diverse, I'm bringing wealth already to where I am. And my soul is this where I am. For it to be able to give me the uh, aroma of uh, proudness is by exploiting the positive out of it. So entrepreneurship is the best way to develop uh, uh, integration and let's have more of that support to the uh, particular BME individuals to get them to go in that route. That's my contribution for today. I can talk for longer, but 10 minutes, yeah. that's what they gave me. Thank I, you. I, I, I guess you might be able to talk for longer, Jabo. That was fabulous. Thank you ever so much. And if I knew how to work the clap function, I'd surely put it on. So um, well done. Well done, my friend. So moving on now to our next uh, speaker, I'm delighted to uh, present uh, Shania, Shania Ferdinand from NatWest Bank. Shania, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monda. And um, also, it's, can I say it's just a bit intimidating to, to follow that talk, but I will try my best. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for having me here today. Um, I work at NatWest as one of the enterprise managers. And within the role that I do, I work as part of our en wider enterprise team. Um, and we look at ways that we can support uh, business owners and by helping them to access uh, the programs of support that we offer, but also working closely with our communities um, and partnering with organisations that also provide support so that we can really engage better with the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, for a number of years, we have committed to supporting small businesses to grow and to thrive. And we do recognise that there are many who continue to face barriers, which we want to try to help and remove. Um, last year, we announced our enterprise goals and 
as part of our enterprise goals, we committed to supporting businesses and helping to create 50,000 new businesses across the UK by 2023. And our ambition is to focus that support directly into the communities that face the highest barriers. So with that being said, the people that we have committed to supporting, we want to ensure that 75% of our enterprise programmes are based outside of London and the South East, as we're aware that a lot of um, business support um, previously was concentrated in the capital. We want to ensure that 60% of our support um, goes to female entrepreneurs, 20% of our support um, goes to black, Asian and minority ethnic entrepreneurs, and 10% of that support is also focused on helping to create um, purpose-led businesses that demonstrate social impact. Um, I'm really pleased to actually be able to share that since we've had these commitments, we've exceeded our 20% target for black, Asian and minority ethnic entrepreneurs, and are currently through our programmes have 26% that we're supporting from these backgrounds, but we also understand that there is more to do and there are always more people to support and we're definitely open and, and happy to working more closely with our communities. Um, some of the ways that we do provide this support um, is through our Entrepreneur Accelerator programme, which has been running for a number of years. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of it or aren't aware of it, the Accelerator supports and empowers UK entrepreneurs to scale their businesses um, through one-to-one -one coaching, access to educational events, um, access to thought leadership content, and it also provides a network of like-minded peers to, to help with, with um, having those relatable role models, but also being able to have access to experts within the fields that entrepreneurs are working within. Um, our accelerator is based all around the UK, so we have hubs in most of the larger cities in the UK. And also we are now specialising in supporting purpose led climate businesses, high growth businesses and fintech businesses. And in addition to this, we also offer our business builder programme, which is an online course that has contains practical resources and it helps business owners with digital and event based learning and also offers access to a digital community. Um, as we're aware, since the pandemic uh, happened, a lot of us are collaborating and working together using more digital tools as, as ever. So we took our support online so that we could still provide support to, to our communities. Um, we also have local enterprise managers who work, who are based within and work within their communities alongside local partners, including growth hubs, to help support business owners and trying to connect them with the right help that they need at the right time for their business. And one of the things that they really um, do is provide that education support. So helping business owners to understand when it comes to accessing finance, um, what it is that the bank requires, why they require that, and just really trying to help arm them to be ready for, for that particular type of support. Um, we also work, as I mentioned earlier, work very closely with local partners um, in, in areas um, helping to deliver help and support through the content that we provide through our accelerator programs. And we've worked with a number of organisations that specifically focus on supporting black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And we are all, always um, looking for more partners that are around that we can support through through the um, through the content that we have. Um, aside from our enterprise support, last year our CEO set up a racial equality task force which was led by the chairs of our multicultural network and some of our executive leaders and they spent six months understanding the lived experiences of our black, Asian and minority ethnic colleagues um, and this work that they did culminated in a report that was launched a year ago called Banking on Racial Equality and within that report we committed to 10 commitments to work towards better racial equalities um, as well as for our colleagues but also for our customers and our communities and just to give you an idea of some of the commitments that were made as part of that specifically the ones that pertain to our communities is to deliver enterprise and career education programs and again as I said we work closely with our partners to do this um, working to understand socio-economic barriers facing black Asian and minority ethnic customers through research and some of our strategic partnerships um, amplifying Black, Asian and minority ethnic voices through our marketing and communication platforms as we know and understand that, that one of the barriers that is also faced is that representation piece and having relatable role models who, 
who we can who business owners and customers can look to to say actually I can I can see it so I can be it um, ensuring that our suppliers are as diverse as our customers and communities and our supply supply chain um, team are working very hard to diversify our supply chains and committing to some ongoing work and finally helping to build financial capability in the UK within our communities as well as at school level but also older um, so last week uh, we released the one year on anniversary report which has highlighted the progress that has been made on some of those commitments and I'm happy to share the links if anyone wants to, to read um, the banking on racial equality report or the the one year anniversary report but as part of that work I've also been working very closely with Professor Monda Ram and the Centre for Research and Ethnic Minority Entrepreneurship on what I think is a groundbreaking piece of research and we're really excited to continue working on that together and for us to release, the, release that later in due course but the thing that's really great about it is that report we think will make really meaningful and impactful changes for ethnic minority businesses but will also help us to inform our strategy for how we support and engage with businesses going forwards. Um, we know that we still have work to do but we are committed to continuing to listen, learn and work in collaborative with businesses, policy makers and our industry peers to deliver meaningful change to this important agenda as we know that no one organisation can do this alone, but if we all work together, we can definitely make meaningful, tangible change and support creating a fairer recovery for our communities and for the country. And I think I might just be a minute under my time. So I'll hand back to Manda. You're on mute. Thanks, Shania. That was brilliant. On time and on point uh, as well. So thank you ever so much again. I said right at the outset that um, there is a lot of goodwill out there and uh, uh, there's a real opportunity and a lot of it is coming from the finance sector as we've just seen. So now we're going to move on to our discussants who have kindly agreed to share their insights into what our expert panel have said. So let me move on to our first discussant, it's Yemi, Yemi Jackson. Have we got Yemi here? Right. I can't see see her. Uh, she's muted, but uh, she's still muted, so. Is she still? She's still. Have we got Yemi? I'll give you a couple more seconds. If we, we haven't, then I'll we'll move on to Brenda. Okay, Brenda, do you want, if Yemi comes in, we'll put her on a bit later. Um, Brenda, do you want to come in now? Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me. And I will start by saying Jambo. I've learned <laughs> a new word. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, I'm, I want to thank the, 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 the speakers, and including yourself, um, Professor Mondoloran for your for for each of your contributions. Now, as it happens, um, in, in I mean, in 2014 2015, I did do a paper because I was part of EU institution talking about um, uh, um, minority entrepreneurs. So I, you know, in preparing for this meeting, I, I looked over um, that paper, you know, to help with the contribution that was made. And it was quite interesting because as um, um, a lot of people mentioned, you know, some of the, the contribution um, that, uh, the, uh, uh, that the, these entrepreneurs bring, um, I like... Uh, Jabo, when he said, you know, you bring yourself, you bring, you know, that 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 culture behind you. Uh, we talk about the skills and the talents that they bring, um, the fact that they they create employment. And one of the things not mentioned, which I had picked up in my report, because I, I think in Sweden they did a bit of research on this, you know, and I bring this in the in the context of global Britain, 
they bring trade opportunities because the jamba so you bring a bit of yourself and that includes you're from Rwanda so some of the things that you bring uh, is because you know some of the things you cannot access here so you make those trade links and so the country benefits from that. So, no, I think that fits in very well, you know, when, when politicians talk about global Britain. So that's something that entrepreneurs um, um, bring. But, you know, all the other stuff that, that has been mentioned, the fact about revitalizing neighborhoods, um, creating employment, uh, all of that has been said. And the other thing that um, I, I found is that, um, that minorities, uh, as you know, as a racial of the population, they're overrepresented in the entrepreneurial space, and I'm sure there's a variety of reasons for that. And I'm very pleased um, that uh, that Helen, uh, Professor at Lambton Smith, she talked about you know the the synergies with linking with universities because she she, she talked about credibility, but I think one of the key things which he brought out is data, because data is very important. And with the link with the parliament, with the special advisors, you know, because they want to speak to policymakers, speaking to policymakers in terms of the robustness of data is a very good thing. Coming on to barriers, um, yes, everyone mentions uh, access to finance. I mean, that's a big, big thing. Uh, and I think uh, in France, they did a lot of research to show that minority uh, uh, business don't tend to last as long as you know, the indigenous population. And and I think, Jabba, you, you mentioned it quite well, you know, you, you're not allowed to fear, you're not allowed to learn, you know, learn from your mistakes and then move on. And this is this is a big thing. But another thing um, is actually access to networks. You know, Helen mentioned networks, and I, I guess it would be things like um, I heard someone mention the Federation of Small Business, you know, cham chambers of commerce, where you can, you know, learn from others. And minority entrepreneurs um, are not always welcomed in these mainstream networks and I think this is something that needs to be looked at and addressed. Now um, Ms Ferdinand you mentioned that uh, you have a target of 20, NatWest has a target of access to finance for you, a 20 percent um, you said for black, um, um, Asian and minority um, entrepreneurs and I want to congratulate um, NatWest for that, and you say that 26%, you currently in 26%, but I know you know what I'm going to say next, because it has been a debate, especially within the Black community, that when you bring, you know, Black and Asian together, because when we think of entrepreneurs, especially minority entrepreneurs, I think we can all agree, a lot of people think about Asian entrepreneurs. Very few people think about Black entrepreneurs. Um, so I don't know if you know when, when um, people walk through your door for finance, if they're Asian, if a black entrepreneur gets a different experience because the perception they don't see um, <laughs> a black citizens as being entrepreneurs the way they see Asians. So that's... Yeah. Um, Brenda, I'm, I'm going to have to sort of wrap up. I'm happy to stop here. I'm happy to yeah. stop here. Yeah, but thanks for your well, thanks for your contribution. Though you made some really, you know, pertinent points: international trade and the different experience of different minority groups. So thank you very much for those points. I'm just going to see if Yemi's here now. Have we got Yemi? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Hiya. I've been here. <laughs> yeah, Hiya. yeah. Hi, hi, Yemi. Looking forward to hearing from you now. Wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting us to be able to contribute to this, really. Um, I'm a fairly young entrepreneur, so I started kind of my business um, in, in 2018, sort of really early 2019. And, and the biggest challenge, really, to echo what Brenda said, is about getting into that circle of others promoting your business. Um, so what you tend to find is that, and again, I will be sort of lumping us all together, hasn't really helped us in terms of the black community in progressing business. Because what you tend to find, actually, in most business networks that I, I go to is mainly sort of dominated by Asian 
um, community really and and in actual fact the, the the black entrepreneurs tend to be quite new and if anything they need more support so I really would like you know so my sort of plea is if it's possible to have something that's a lot more tailored in terms of it, it, it's not so much of the fact that we you know we're just because we're black we want more we, we just need something that's going to address the underrepresentation because if the purpose of a lot of the the work that we're doing here is addressing inequity then surely that inequity needs to be looked at within also ethnic minorities right and um, so, so so for example even things like the you know when you look at sort of pay gap um, you tend to find actually within the bank community there's huge disparities and my concern having been part of a network that I've decided not to be part of anymore because I just found that every event was very much tailored towards a certain group within the ethnic minorities and we were not really getting enough enough of what I'll say is a, sort of a fair share of the pie and then unfortunately when and when progress is measured is measured at that group and everything appears to be okay so um, so yeah, that's one of um, one of the things I've noticed. Um, the other thing is that what I find is that lots of people want to teach us, <laughs> but what we need is more business. So, <laughs> so there is this very much, uh, uh, you know. I mean, I mean, I'm very much. I'm, I'm a real, you know, I have a thirst for learning, and um, I, I love learning new things. But it gets to a point where we actually we've learned so much. <laughs> we just want that we want the business. So it's actually how to break that cycle. Um, of it been able to to actually get the opportunity or even if it's a trial and um, I know that you know once one of the groups the, the GLA when we were invited one of the things look it, and the challenge I find also specifically with the black um, um, sort of entrepreneurship group is the fact that a lot of us are quite new and our size our um, sales tend to be quite small so you've got that kind of catch rate where most corporates want you to be of a certain level before they give you the opportunity but then how do you get that opportunity so um, so one of the challenges as well is is that sort of if it's possible where organisations can even give maybe whether I don't know it's a six month trial or twelve month trial to a lots of these really great new entrepreneurs and it's it's very comforting to see that there is actually probably a, a, a higher growth in terms of black entrepreneurship more recently um, and a lot of these guys most of the time I the reason I set up my business is because my corporate career came to unfortunately a grinding halt due to unfortunately facing some unpleasant racism I decided to set up my own business however to then face that also within the entrepreneurship is quite challenging and quite difficult because then you think well where do I go right because we've exited the corporate world with lots of 20 years of experience and you're going to entrepreneurship and you're still having to sort of face some of the some of the challenges so um, and then the other thing that would be really good um is something I've wanted to set up and I got a bit too overwhelmed by it, is some kind of um the BNI works really well because they have this kind of referral where they really, really uh, bought into each other's businesses and, and they refer. So I, I find sometimes within, I would say particularly within the black entrepreneurial circle, there's not enough of referring each other's businesses. And I think that's one of the things that other groups do really, really well and actually, actually help their growth. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just feel that's the only way to, you know, to break the cycle if organisations could give us um, well, apart from, I mean, I've not had to, I've deliberately not gone down trying to get capital. I know that's always, a, that's been a lot of barriers for a lot of black people in terms of trying to get capital. Um, I know sometimes they say it's because maybe you know, some people were, were nervous about debt and things like that. But I think it's more the fact that they then feel somebody else will come in and, and take over. So there's a little bit of education there. So just in summary, in terms of my thoughts on this is that um, we can't group, we can't be grouped together as this sort of um, group of ethnic minorities because actually I think the A within the BAME are doing quite well <laughs> and we need to learn from them you know what they do well one of the things they do very well is they do refer each other and they very much do support one another within that community so it's not there it's not a question of well they're doing well at the expense of us this the, the pie is big enough for all of us so one thing I like to encourage a lot of the black entrepreneurs on here is we need to start referring each other a lot more and um, we need more we need more business rather than more continuous teaching <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think probably most black people that I know are one of the most educated because um, it's drummed into us from a very, very young age. And, and it's just let's go do another innovation. Let's do another, um, you know, it's, it, we can continue, you know, continue to be educated. But actually what we need is the opportunity. And if it is possible to, you know, to try and convince whether even if we can't maybe get to corporates, because obviously a lot of their things about commercial, if it's possible to lobby government bodies, to create something, you know, they've done it for SMEs, 
are they able to specifically do it within that SME space? They've made opportunities for small businesses to get on that sort of opportunity to bid for smaller businesses. Is it possible to make that break that down further and give yeah. black businesses the, the same sort of level of opportunity? Thank you, Yemi. Some uh, really uh, insightful observations here. Thank you very much. Um, can I now invite Kim, Kim Mamende? Hello. Hi, Kim. Hi. Um, thank you, Professor, and thank you to everyone um, who's spoken before. Um, it's been a really great um, opportunity just being here and listening in, to be fair. Um, obviously, it's such an important topic, as we all have said, because um, Small businesses are the backbone of the business sector in the UK, but even though it's become more diverse and you know there's pools of talent from all around the world, there's still not um, enough support. So for me, um, I'm from the Centre for African Entrepreneurship, which is a small charity based in Swansea in Wales, and we work to essentially create a vibrant BME community where everyone is empowered and supported to succeed. And we primarily work with refugee and asylum seeking groups and um, particularly young people with a business idea or would one day want to become entrepreneurs or turn the side hustle into a business and work to fill that gap in provision that we've all um, highlighted in the session today. And I would just want to say that even though we are all talking about the same group of ethnically diverse people, um, even with that, in, within that wider group, there is people with additional barriers and additional challenges just because of their backgrounds, just because of where they've come from, people that have grown up in another country and have had to claim asylum in the UK at an older age and now are refugees or whatever it may be. Those people will have way more barriers than maybe people that are BME and still um, could have been brought up here in the UK. So I think it's important to also then just consider those different groups within the wider sort of subsets that we're talking about. Um, refugees are known to have, I think, it's a, it's a third higher chance of them becoming more self-employed than the normal British-born population. So there still needs to be more um, that is done to support these groups and targeting them on a specific um, on a specific level. So um, just echoing what everyone has said, one of the main things, though, which may seem small, but language barriers has been one of the main things that we've seen with people that have an idea. Um, just because English is not your first language does not make a person any less capable of them creating a successful business. And there should still be support for people that still have those ideas um, from that you know, early, very early stage, even though they might have just recently received their documentation, documentation or whatever, there should still be support from that small sort of early stage. Um, secondly, I think someone has mentioned this already, um, we see that most of our entrepreneurs have quite untraditional business ideas and normally these raise doubts in support providers. So I think it's up to support providers themselves to educate themselves and just open themselves up to supporting people from different backgrounds. Because if we're saying the UK is a country of a sanctuary, um, a globally responsible country, we should be open to all the different ideas that are coming on from different parts of the world. Um, thirdly, I think this is more specific to women and has been touched on by Professor Helen. Um, women normally have um, additional cultural responsibilities, which again need to be taken into consideration because we know people from our different communities will have very different responsibilities to maybe the typical um, British born young woman. So to take that into account and to still be able to support them adequately um, in spite of this. And then um, I think what uh, the previous speakers have mostly spoken about is the lack of diverse supportive networks. Um, apart, apart from us being able to be plugged into the wider big networks, us creating these spaces for ourselves and um, just being able to support each other through the um, through the journey and finally and most importantly access to finance that has been raised by everyone. So I think that all these factors need to be taken into account and systems need to be put in place to support people accordingly. And I believe that um, this can only be done through a collaborative approach. No one can do this 
on their own. And people, in as much as we might have forums like this, where we talk about it and raise it or, you know, do all the research that we can do, things need to actually be done because talking is well and good, but what are we doing? What are the next steps that we are taking um, to achieve this? So thank you so much um, for inviting me. Um, I've just tried to rush through everything because I think, yeah, time yeah. is tight. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, let's just continue working together and take it a step further from just, you know, holding conversations like this. And yeah, hopefully we can all contribute to a better landscape for diverse entrepreneurs in this country. Thank you very much, Kim. You, you've made your points very, very, very clearly and very eloquently. Thank you very much. Now, we've got an opportunity for questions from the audience. Um, so if any of you would like to ask a question, you can either unmute yourselves or just put it in the chat. And while we Wait for uh, the first one, to, uh, first uh, contributor Hi, to man. ask her. Hi, Eugene. I thought Hi, it might man. be you. How are you? Nice to see you. Good to see you again. Eugene, uh, rather than just having a conversation between you and me, uh, admiring your jumper, maybe you put your question to whoever you'd like. I think the question is to all the panelists. Uh, considering the new published innovation strategy two months ago, which focuses on um, accelerating economic recovery and growth through innovation. I'm sure you've seen the innovation strategy within the Department of Business and Skills. How can we encourage more a Black and African business community to, to, to venture into innovate, innovation driven business, especially STEM and all those? And I'm looking in a way considering the UK, of, of course, like Manchester is, is being positioned as the digital city for the UK with mm. ID Manchester or QQ, uh, Liverpool and all those. But we are yeah. seeing a lot of uh, minority who are doing businesses that are innovation led, which means they don't also benefit from Innovate UK funding and grants and all those. How do you see we can bridge yeah. that gap to make sure that we are seeing more minority into innovation led businesses? That's a brilliant question, um, uh, Eugene. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know, uh, Eugene is a leading light behind the African uh, Chamber of Commerce, and he's done a huge amount of brilliant work in profiling the contribution of uh, African businesses. Not only doing that, you know, Eugene walks the talk. You know, he talks about innovation, talks about international trends, and uh, I think Kim made a point of action. Um, Eugene's uh, network really does. Um, put things into practice. Um, Eugene mentioned a point about innovation. Uh, Helen, did you want to come in and, uh, you know, you, because you talked about innovation in your presentation and you talked about networks, maybe you start and then we'll have Jabo after you. Yes, well, I'm not an expert on this, but my, my starting point was that Innovate UK has made these commitments to equality, diversity and innovation. And what they're doing at the moment is, is gathering information. So there is a team within Innovate UK that are talking to people. I don't know whether uh, Lorraine has spoken to any of you, but, but they are gathering evidence. So anything you can say to Innovate UK will inform their thinking. And I think this it's been very clear today that there are different gr groups within ethnic diverse populations of entrepreneurs. And that is a very strong point about recognizing the starting point from, from people, where they are, what the, what they're understanding. And, and, and Jabo made that, that point very clearly. So it's really only more talk from me rather than any any definite answer about okay. the step forward. Jabo. Yes. Um, hi, Eugene. And, uh, good oh, to hi. see you. <laughs> And well done for your what you're doing uh, in the in that region, and uh, it's really good. Um, talking about diversity and the wealth of uh, what we have, me and Eugene, we have about three languages in common. We can be talking here, <laughs> three different from English. Uh, the the question you just mentioned, it's a uh, for me. I'm seeing it on that part of uh, uh, role models. They say birds of the same uh, feathers fly together or flock together. How many individuals you know currently? From the black community who are already in those type of businesses 
who run a business in the um, fintech or um, technology or those uh, innovative uh, with technology businesses from the black community. Very, very few, if none. So the young people, anyone else, not going to be inspired to go in there because they haven't got any role model to look like them, who's like them, who's doing that, or they've never heard about it. So having um, networking like what you've got, it gives a chance for individuals from that black community coming into an environment where they'll hear, although the person is not like them, but they'll hear there's this opportunity. So networking and those specific type of networking will be good to start with. Two is how do we encourage individuals to go there by giving them that chance of falling small, trying errors in that industry. So that Innovate UK creating a fund looking for that specific um, uh, demographic and then getting the parents themselves to be encouraging their children to go in that element. I always give an example of Alexa. Most people here may know about Alexa or may not know. Kim was talking about individuals from the uh, uh, refugee and asylum background uh, where you see uh, um, the Maslow hierarchy, uh, the need. I'm not going to jump and get an Alexa or AI in my household while I'm still learning what is to use all these other elements. So my child goes to the nursery, nursery use Alexas. She comes home or he comes home and he starts saying in the household, Alexa, play this. Mom and dad don't know what is Alexa. They, they haven't got a clue about it. They won't even bring it in the household. So who is our role model? What is we bring? How do we bring technology in this household? Is through those networking or funding those type of projects where they'll be piloted and sing along about it, talk about it quite a lot, celebrate it. So do a lot of events to celebrate it. That will be my uh, advice. Thanks, Jabo. I'm going to ask uh, Shania to come in and then Brenda after Shania. Um, thank you, Eugene. Uh, nice to see you again and a really interesting question. I think when it comes to, I guess, encouraging more diversity in innovation, there's there's a number of things that can be kind of looked at. I think there's, there's also an issue with diversity and innovation when it comes to gender. We know that there's it tends to feel like a bit of a club sometimes. But I think, number one, there are a number of organisations that are um, looking to address this and support this. So there's UK Black Tech, um, there's Colour in Tech, um, also the organisation Foundervine, um, who helped to support diverse founders startup and a lot of their focus is on finding sort of tech and innovative um, startup businesses. So I think um, Innovate UK being able to engage and collaborate with partners like that, because I truly believe that um, no one knows what they don't know. And oftentimes there's support or there's help or there's funds, but because people don't know where to look, it's um, from both the organisation's perspective, but also, um, I guess, the community's perspective to try to bridge those gaps to really engage with each other. And one of the ways that I've really tried to engage better with communities, as I said, is through those partnerships where we know they're already working with those communities. So making sure that we're working with them to try to get the message to as many people as possible, um, but also to, I guess, just um, jump on Jabbo's point about, I think, again, when it comes to if we're thinking about technology innovation, um, when I think back to when I was at school and just the careers conversations I had, I say the careers conversations, it was probably conversation and it just, you're not children or young people aren't necessarily made aware of all of the diverse options there are or encouraged to go in certain directions, especially um, certain people who come from certain demographics aren't necessarily encouraged. So I think there's something to be said for organisations who are in those fields and I know that there are some that are doing it but again it's just how can we leverage it and do it more being able to go into schools and communicate with people who are at that age where they're making decisions about what do I want my career to be where do I go and as you said Jabba having those really relatable role models but also just being able to be made aware of, of those things because um, I'd say 90% of the jobs that exist now I definitely wouldn't have known about. So it's being able for people to understand what what jobs are available and how can I get there. Thanks, Shania. Uh, Brenda, you wanted to come in. Yes, I, I just I, I just want to turn that question around a bit, Eugene. Do we know, um, or or does Innovate UK know um, how many um, 
how many uh, black entrepreneurs or minority entrepreneurs apply for that fund and how many are successful? I mean, do they capture that? that yes. Uh, to give you an example, um, I also work for Innovate UK as a, an innovation and growth advisor for Northwest. Uh, in terms of the funding, for example, there was women in innovation funding. Last year, there was only one woman out of 50. So this year, we tried to, to raise the awareness a lot of businesses I spoke to. They were not aware about it. However, also, I think uh, Helen, I've spoken to, to, to Lorraine from Northern Ireland and some of the directors. The, the issue within Innovate UK also is that is the, there's no the, the EDI strategy is not inclusive enough. I've mm. raised the question and they told me there's no funding to, 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 to fund some of these activities or I think they need a change of approach. Because I'm I'm involved with, uh, with a digital health startup. I mean, it's won a couple of awards. We have applied three times. We weren't successful. It could be because we are not. Our, our application wasn't very good. So no, the criteria thought, the criteria also eliminate yes. a lot of minorities. So, for example, I've told them before, like uh, they are looking for businesses either turn over 500k and above, employees 10 and above. So I say. That will eliminate almost 90% of my no Thank you. Thank you. They don't qualify. So we need to to be more flexible with the criteria, take into consideration most of the minority businesses are SMEs with one or two, three employees. So that's where why my, my majority of the time don't qualify. So maybe that might be what you experience. So yeah. 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 And I think the interface with Innovate UK is is, is so difficult to, to navigate. I try and use it for my students in the class and it's impossible. But I think your point about the inclusivity agenda in Innovate UK is well made. And it's exactly the same with UKRI. They have a commitment, but it's it's making sure that it's universal and it's not not an issue by itself anymore. It should be inclusive. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in government circles to, to to get to where we where we want to be. I mean, so I don't you, know what the solution is. I mean, I think Eugene, you raised a really interesting and important point about a sort of criteria that apply to everyone, but have a disproportionate effect on particular groups. So you you know so if you look at the profile of black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs they tend to be a lot smaller. They tend to be in particular sectors. They tend to be in particular regions. Right? And so if you apply generic criteria, they're going to fall foul of that. So if you take, for example, one uh, very recent government flagship policy, Help to Grow, which I think is a really important initiative. It's about productivity. It's about developing your people. Um, if you're under five employees, you, you, you don't qualify. Uh, the overwhelming majority of black and ethnic minority businesses are have fewer than five workers. They mostly have on their own. And, 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 and that's one thing. And the second thing is the, the kind of modern day contemporary working relationships. It doesn't always take into it didn't always take the form of an employer and employee. They will collaborate, or they employ people on different contractual arrangements, which are sensible, economic, productive, but they don't conform to the criteria imposed by whatever funding body. And that point, uh, so uh, you know, I, I I think it's wider than Innovate UK. I think it's quite a, a generic issue. And, um, you know, we, in our work, we, we've talked about the importance of building relationships with the communities on the ground. So you get to understand um, the nature of the, yeah, understand the communities, but also understand the businesses as well and how they operate. I mean, you will know from your own experience, you know, there's some brilliant, very, very small businesses that uh, are pursuing international trading relationships, but they wouldn't fit the stereotype of having five employees, 10 employees that are operating in a particular way. Um, so I think I, I personally think it's a really big issue. So you, you, you're muted, Eugene. Also, plus the current economic climate is not encouraging for businesses to take on new employees. When yeah, they that's right. Yeah. To, so they are trying to minimize costs, take advantage of remote working or virtual technology. Yeah. Digitization itself has given more opportunity 
to do more with less workers, more technologies. So mm. I think something maybe we, we need to look at again and continue to communicate in, in most of yeah. organizations to see how they can improve the criteria. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, are there sort of any other, are there any questions in the chat? I'm just having a quick look. Are there any other questions in the chat? There's a long, uh, almost an essay from you, Ijebo. Um, uh, <laughs> do you want to praise it and put it in a, as a question to your uh, fellow panelists? I think, I, think um, I was just putting in the chat there because uh, it's something I'm really passionate about. And, and you did mention at the start of the beginning is, is the sectors where you're finding individuals from the black community thriving or the Asian community thriving in and not in another sector. And it starts to think where you, you follow up your footpath of your parents or someone else you see doing it. And if it's something passed on, it comes from one family to another. So how do we diverse it to in that, in the other industry? We're here in the Southwest. I have Babcock next to me. I have a precious yacht next to me. How do we get a supplier chain into that? But if I don't have anyone who's done it before, how to break that yeah. chain? So how do we do to encourage the next generation? But also celebrating our own journeys as well, because it's amazing. What we're doing is amazing. But how do we celebrate that more and demonstrating it uh, in that um, inclusive concept? Okay, that's important. Well, let's, uh, let's yeah, be, before we address that, I think that there is a, actually a question from one of our uh, attendees who is someone I know very well. Eva, Eva Kasparova. Eva, do you want to pose your question? Um, yes, hi, Monda. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone, or Jumbo. Um, um, thank you very much for all your contributions. It was, it was really fascinating listening to you. And something I wanted to ask, I guess, everybody, but mainly, mainly Helen, going back to your research, Helen, you, you said that a lot of the research, a lot of the support that you found is very fragmented. And that there is actually quite a bit of support, but it's, disjo but it's disjointed. And my question was, you know, have you found any good practice of where that, I think, you know, those kind of bottom up initiatives are better linked up with the top down kind of approach or, you know, what, what can be done? I guess my question is what can we do to overcome that fragmentation and disjointed kind of initiatives being kind of spread up across the country, but not where people are not working together? Um, you know, what, what could be done? What, what could be done about joining up that support? I, I think that's a, a fundamental question, and I don't really have the answer because what I've been doing is through our website and getting people to talk to each other. The cabinet office has got a regional stakeholder approach for people with disabilities, and whether there is initiative by Innovate UK or, or the cabinet office to do that, but that will be top down. Um, I don't know what the answer is because the people have got different interests and they might not want to, to join to, together with other people. I, I'd, I'd be much more interested in the, what the networks say that they are practitioners rather than me as a researcher. But I, I put in the chat uh, yesterday we had a EU regions uh, uh, presentation and somebody from the East Sussex Chamber of Commerce said, I want to increase the diversity of our, our membership. How do I go about it? Well, I didn't really have an answer for that either, because as far as I could find, there were, were no networks of uh, disabled or, or ethnically diverse entrepreneurs in East Sussex. So I think it's a, it's a major question and I don't, I don't have the answer. But thank you for raising it. Okay, uh, thank a, you. I, I, I can see another question um, from Cassie, Cassie Roberts. You're on mute, Cass uh, Cassie. Hi, I'm Cassie. Um, I'm one of the founders of a charity that started 20 years ago um, supporting asylum seekers and refugees based in Plymouth. So we have a lot to do with Jabbo, and in fact, Jabbo's wife is one of our trustees. Um, and I just, I just thought I'd reflect a little bit on some of the conversation but also that question that you've just asked Helen so Plymouth 20 years ago was 99.9% .9 white British we have a very very small um, black and minority ethnic community in fact we had a very small black community it was largely an Asian community in the city at that time 
and with dispersal of asylum seekers into the city, obviously the the demographics of the city have changed, and I think we're now at 93% by British. So obviously that that has meant that there are now people like Jabo and others who have, who have settled in Plymouth, in Plymouth. Um, but we're still a city of largely first generation migrant peoples. So through the asylum system and we don't yet have lots of refugees coming from around the country to coming in Plymouth. In fact, generally what happens is when people get their status to stay, um, at least 28 percent of them will go to other parts of the, of the country because they've either got connections there already or um, or they can't find work. So some of the things that we've been trying to do over the last five or six years is looking at how can we support those who are getting to that place of actually wanting to stay in Plymouth and Jabbo, Jabbo's been doing a lot of work around um, self-employment. Um, but one of my biggest questions right at the very beginning, because I come from a business background. Yes, we started a charity, my husband and I, but I come from a business background. And my my question is similar to Helen, is that I kept thinking, OK, so we we working with with DBI Jabbo's business, we we actually um, mapped where all the BAME community businesses are for an awards, a BAME awards, which DBI host and run. And um, and if we can do that, I don't know why the Chambers of Commerce can't. Mm. So so for me, the 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 it would be sad to have two parallel Chambers of Commerce if in an integrated society. And so the challenge for us in Plymouth with with Jabbo and with others is to try and get those two those two groups of organisations and companies working together. Um, the BME community doesn't recognise the Chamber particularly. They are very, very small businesses largely, as Jabba has already alluded to. Um, and so the, the, the Chamber of Commerce doesn't necessarily represent them in some of the things that they're looking to do. Big vision, big this, big that. So it's, it's, it's trying to work out how we do that as communities and, and I don't know that can be done nationally because each city and each town and each area is very very different if you go to the northwest northwest northeast the, the the and the west midlands where I come from it's very different um yeah. but it's a challenge that it, it, it is different and innovate UK could probably rec start to recognize that regional differences down to local city differences down to local town differences are very 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 different and I don't know that's necessarily recognised. It still tends to be very huge conurbation centric um, but some of the fastest growth for SMEs is coming from the regions like the southwest. Right. So I just thought 